Hello Upper for six. Um, we still have a little bit left to do on telescopes and detectors. So just one more lesson, um, which I'm trying to get through um, for you to do by the end of this week. And then we start stars. Um, remember there's three topics in the astrophysics module. There's detectors and telescopes, then there's stars. And the last bit is galaxies and, and cosmology. So the last bit of the telescopes and detectors, um, there's two things really that we still have to look at. Um, it's more descriptive this than anything else. There's no calculations involved. It's pretty straightforward. Um, like before, I'll give you some notes and, uh, and also um, some homework to do on this. But um, basically the two little bits we still have to do on telescopes and detectors are First of all, um, we have to talk about detectors themselves, um, so basically cameras that we put on telescopes. And we also have to talk about observing um, with different wavelengths other than visible light. And we have to discuss the, um, the atmosphere, um, how opaque or transparent the atmosphere is to different wavelengths and also um, the design of, of telescopes um, in, in very sort of um, rough detail for the different wavelengths. OK, so um, just to start off then with detectors. Um, so a detector is an instrument we put on a telescope to, to record um, what we're seeing, to record the, the image. Um, now, the first detector that was used on telescopes was obviously um, the human eye, um, looking at an image through an eyepiece, which does have an advantage. It's very convenient to just look down a telescope. Um, on the other hand, you can't record what you're seeing um, digitally or electronically. Um, you know, in the old days, um, you know, um, more than 100 years ago, when people did do their observations by eye, they would have to write or, or draw what they saw. So uh, Galileo when he first used a telescope, he did lots of drawings of, of, of what he saw. Obviously, that's not really um, acceptable. Um, modern scientific uh, um, analysis requires you to, to have data that you can, you can uh, reproduce and, uh, and, and store electronically. Um, so um, what happened when uh, what happened 100 years ago is, is that we started using photographic film. As a, as a detector to, to record um, the images that we were seeing through telescopes. So you can put a photographic film, for instance, on the, uh, the primary focus point of, um, of your mirror, if it's a reflecting telescope, and you can record an image that way. Um, about 30, 40 years ago, this was then superseded by electronic detectors. Um, now, electronic or digital detectors, um, very similar to what you have um, today in your smartphones and your digital cameras. Um, they're basically uh, little tiny electronic chips, semiconductor chips. Um, the most common design is called a CCD or a charged couple device. Um, I've actually got a, um, an old CCD camera of mine um, that I use for astronomy. I've taken the lens off. Um, just to show you what a CCD looks like. They are very tiny. You would see the same thing if you were to take your smartphone apart and have a look at the camera. But um, I don't know if that can focus very well. Um, but it's that tiny little um, rectangular chip that you can see in the middle. That's the, that's the CCD, the charged couple device. It's probably about, I want to say, five millimetres by three millimetres across this particular CCD. So that's a charged couple device. Um, what is a charged couple device? Um, well, it's, it's, as I said, it's a small rectangular chip. It's covered in light sensitive pixels. Um, you probably all heard the expression megapixels talking about how many pixels there are on a camera. It's usually a selling point for smartphones. You know, this, this smartphone has a eight megapixel camera. This smartphone has a 10 megapixel camera. Well, that's just referring to the number of pixels. So a megapixel is, is a million pixels. Um, now, each pixel on a, on a CCD chip is actually a tiny capacitor. Um, it's basically made um, by, by sandwiching a, an insulator, a layer of oxide, between an electrode on one side 
and a piece of semiconductor on the other side. Um, now you don't have to know in great detail how a, a CCD works, but basically it's it's kind of similar to the photoelectric effect. When a when a photon of uh, of light comes in, it basically knocks an electron or liberates an electron from the semiconductor, which then gets trapped um, underneath the the layer of oxide. So basically, the the more light falls onto a pixel, or the more photons fall onto a pixel, um, the larger the charge that gets built up on that pixel. It, it builds up charge in the same way that a capacitor charges up. Um, and then at the end, all the pixels, uh, through some quite fancy electronics, all the pixels are, are in sequence, read out, um, and then stored electronically, which is which is where your image comes from. So each pixel will, will have a record of how much light has fallen onto that particular pixel or how many photons have fallen onto that particular pixel. Okay, so that's that's basically how a, how a pixel, how a, a CCD camera works. Um, what are the advantages of using a, a CCD camera like this one instead of just looking down um, an eyepiece, um, an image through a telescope. Well, there are actually quite a lot of advantages um, for, for for CCD cameras as opposed to the human eye. Um, one thing, as I as I already said, you can save and um, save, record, and, and analyze um, the image, um, which you can't do when you're just looking at something. Um, you can also um, set the exposure time um, to a large amount of time. So, for instance, you can um, set a CCD camera to expose not for a fraction of a second, but for 10 seconds or 30 seconds or 10 minutes or one hour. Um, you can expose a CCD um, for as long as you want, um, providing you don't overexpose um, the CCD. Now, this has a... This is an advantage because it means you can build up um, light over a large period of time and therefore um, record very, very faint levels of light. Um, your eye, on the other hand, works a bit like a video camera. Um, it's constantly reading the the, the light levels out um, on, a, on a rolling basis. So it only exposes for a, a tiny fraction of a second before sending the information to your brain um, about how much light is falling onto each each part of the the retina at the back of your eye, um, so your eye works like a video camera, whereas a CCD camera can be used to to integrate an image um, over a long period of time by setting a large exposure time. So you can see much fainter um, using a CCD camera than you can do with your eye. Um, okay, another advantage is that a CCD camera is a very linear detector. Um, now, what that means is that if you double the light level that's falling onto a pixel, you will double the um, charge that builds up on that pixel. Um, so it's very easy to use um, CCD information to actually do photometry or measure light levels um, because it is a linear detector. Now, the eye is, is not a linear detector at all. It's actually a logarithmic detector, which means it doesn't... Uh, it, when you're perceiving an increase in light level, um, if you if you're feeling that the light level is doubling, it's not actually doubling. Um, so there's no relationship really between how much light you perceive is falling into your eye, and and physically how many um, you know watts per per square millimeter are actually falling into your eye. So um, the eye is not a, a linear detector. In fact, photographic film also is, is not a linear detector, but, but CCDs are a linear detector. OK, um, next, the, the um, CCD cameras do have a better spatial resolution than the eye. Now, what that means is that the angle um, of view between the pixels is much smaller than the angle of view between each light sensitive part of the eye. Um, the eye has um, light sensitive cells on its retina um, called rods and cones. You can think of them a bit like the, the, the pixels in a, in a CCD camera. Now it turns out actually the eye has, has many more rods and cones than a CCD camera has got. However, um, those rods and cones actually cover a much greater field of view um, than than a CCD chip. So in terms of the the angle between each light sensitive pixel, if you like, in the eye, 
and uh, and the and the equivalent in a CCD camera, um, the the pixels in a CCD camera are much closer together. In other words, you can you can resolve uh, two objects um, which are much closer together than you can with the eye. That is assuming, of course, that your um, your instrument that you're looking through um, also has an equivalent re resolution. And we did talk in the last lesson about working out the, the limit of resolution of, the, of your telescope. Um, so that's that's basically it. The 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 CCD camera um, is is uh, is better in every way. There is one more advantage as well, actually, that I need to mention, which which does come up quite a bit. Um, which is something called quantum efficiency. Now, what do we mean by quantum efficiency? It's basically for every photon that hits your detector, how how what what is the probability of you detecting that photon? Now, in the case of a CCD camera, the quantum efficiency is something like ninety percent. So, of every ten photons hitting a CCD pixel, um, nine will cause an electron to be liberated from the uh, the semiconductor and you will then count that as part of your um, as part of your count level in that pixel so basically quantum efficiency 90% you you detect 90% of the the photons that 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 hit a pixel um photographic film by the way is about 3% um, quantum efficiency the eye on the other hand is less than 1% quantum efficiency um, so what that means is that um, if 100 photons were to um, hit a particular rod or cone on your retina, um, only once would you see a little little flash. Um, and that would assume that you're in a very, very dark room. Um, so the quantum efficiency of the eye is actually quite poor compared to, in fact, very poor compared to a, a CCD camera. And once again, this means that you can see fainter objects with a CCD camera than you can with the naked eye looking through an eyepiece. So that's basically it for CCD cameras. Um, I am going to photocopy um, an old textbook which, which has some details of, of this in. Um, it is from the old syllabus and it does include details about how CCD cameras are read out, the, the sort of electronics of reading CCD cameras out. This isn't included in the, uh, the the latest AQA syllabus, so you don't need to learn um, how you read out a CCD camera. Although it is it is it is quite interesting in its own right, but um, that's that's basically it. So CCD cameras, little tiny chips that are used to record images from telescopes. Okay, the, the second part that we need to, to learn about today is observing um, with different wavelengths of light um, other than visible light. Um, everything we've talked about so far with telescopes, we've talked about visible light from, from red through to, to, to violet. That's only a very small range of the electromagnetic spectrum from about 380 nanometers to 700 nanometers wavelength. Um, it's an interesting part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, obviously, if you're wanting to observe um, light from stars, it's the uh, it's the it's the region of choice because most stars emit um, a large amount of uh, energy in that part of the spectrum. However, um, there are a lot of interesting physical phenomena that occur which produce electromagnetic waves of different wavelengths that you can't necessarily um, see with your own eye. So you all know the electromagnetic spectrum runs from radio waves at very long wavelengths through microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and then finally the, the shortest, highest energy electromagnetic radiation, which is gamma rays. So um, I'm just briefly going to talk about um, each each band of uh, band of band of radiation um, and and how we observe now. The first thing to consider um, when we talk about this is the atmosphere that we, we have to look through. Um, now, depending on the wavelength that we're looking at, the atmosphere can be transparent, partially transparent or opaque to that particular wavelength, which obviously then determines where we've got to put our telescopes. Um, so if we start off at the, um, at the gamma ray end of the spectrum, um, so gamma rays um, and X-rays as well are very, very short wavelength electromagnetic waves. They don't penetrate the atmosphere at all. 
Um, in fact, they're absorbed um, 50 or 100 kilometers above the ground. Um, various processes like Compton scattering and, and pair production absorb these very high energy um, um, photons um, before they reach the ground, which is actually a good thing for us because they're, they're <coughs> they are quite dangerous. Um, that they, they could cause cancer, and they are being produced um, by astrophysical events um, that produce in the sun's corona. X-rays are. Um, also by more distant events like supernovae and, and black holes and so on. So um, the, these very high energy um, electromagnetic waves are absorbed in the atmosphere, which means you would have to put a telescope above the atmosphere. So to absorb the highest energy, you're talking about putting a telescope above the atmosphere. We then move on to ultraviolet radiation. Um, ultraviolet radiation is mostly absorbed by the atmosphere as well. Um, there is a layer about 20 um, or 30 kilometers above the ground called the ozone layer, which you, you probably heard of, which um, is made of, um, well, has a concentration of oxygen free molecules. And uh, these molecules absorb ultraviolet radiation and prevent it from getting down to the ground, with the exception of the very uh, near ultraviolet that's very close to visible wavelengths, um, sometimes called UVC which does get through, which is what gives you a suntan or a sunburn. Um, but the, the higher energy ultraviolet, um, like the X-rays and the gamma rays, gets, gets fully absorbed. So if you're wanting to observe in, in most of the um, wavelengths of ultraviolet, again, you have to build a satellite with a telescope on and, and put it above the Earth's atmosphere. Very expensive to do, but there are physics advantages in doing that um, in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Um, you know, it's very good for observing um, very hot, newly formed stars um, that have a, a very high temperature above 10,000 degrees. They, they produce lots of ultraviolet and there are various other processes as well, high energy processes that produce ultraviolet um, that, that we want to observe in rather than, than, than visible radiation. So that's, that's ultraviolet um, uh, observations. You have to be above the atmosphere. Um, visible, we've already talked about. Infrared um, is, uh, is, 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 is another interesting wavelength to observe from. Um, with the infrared, um, unlike the, the, the vis visible light can penetrate all the way down to the ground. Um, so you can sight a telescope at ground level. Um, you do get some distortion with visible light coming through to ground level, which is why um, you do put visible telescopes in space as well, like the Hubble Space Telescope. But on the whole, um, visible light can get through to ground level. Infrared, on the other hand, um, quite a bit of infrared gets absorbed by uh, molecules such as carbon dioxide and water vapour in the atmosphere. It is very wavelength dependent. So there are various sort of uh, windows where, where infrared can penetrate largely through to the ground and other, other, way, other bands where, where it can't. Generally speaking, um, if you wanted to observe in the infrared band, you need to get as high up as possible above the water vapor um, in the atmosphere. So um, you'll 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 find infrared telescopes sighted on mountain tops, such as in Hawaii and and elsewhere. Um, but some wavelengths of infrared, and this would go for, for microwaves as well. You do have to observe from space because they are observed, uh, um, obscured or uh, absorbed by the atmosphere. So that's infrared. Um, and then finally, um, radio waves um, do penetrate all the way down to the ground. Um, and in fact, the atmosphere doesn't distort radio waves at all. So there's a, a very wide band of radio waves which, which, which travel straight through the atmosphere, completely unimpeded. Um, so radio telescopes can be situated um, on the ground, and even better than that, they can be situated at sea level. So you don't have to build a, a radio telescope on top of a mountain in, in Hawaii. Or the Canaries. So one of the most famous radio telescopes in the world is in Cheshire, Jodrell Bank, which has a, a 70 meter wide dish. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's the that's that's where you would observe the different wave bands. Um, basically, ground for visible light and radio, and um, telescopes for most of the others. Although some you can get away with being on top of a mountain sometimes on a balloon as well, a balloon or, or aeroplane. Um, okay, so um, as I said, different physical phenomenon for different observing at different wavelengths. So we talked about ultraviolet, 
and X-rays and gamma rays. X-rays and gamma rays, very high energy events, um, exploding stars, black holes, um, the solar corona, ultraviolet, very hot stars, um, visible light, normal stars, um, infrared, um, cooler processes, um, such as um, if you're wanting to look in a, uh, a disk surrounding a newly formed um, star and look at planet formation, um, infrared would be your, your wavelength of choice for looking at, at, at warm areas of the, um, of, of the galaxy. Infrared can also penetrate through, through dust. I've actually got a infrared camera here, which is interesting. So this is the, um, so this is the physics department's infrared camera, just to show you the different physics that goes on when you look at different wavelengths. So if I hold this um, above, if you can see this here. Okay, so there we go. So I think you can see, hopefully you can see me there. Um, so there's different colours there for the different um, amounts of infrared radiation that I'm giving off. Um, you can see that my glasses are coloured blue. Um, that's because um, obviously my glasses are cooler than the rest of my face, so it's giving off less infrared. Um, the, the, the white areas are the hottest, so you can see probably the cheeks and forehead are probably hotter. My nose is probably slightly cooler. So um, obviously that's, that's my face, but you know, do the same thing for the universe and you'll be essentially looking at objects that are giving off heat energy in the universe. So you'll be looking at warm areas. So that's, uh, that's observing in the infrared. Uh, microwaves are used for um, probing the, uh, the Big Bang. So the echo from the Big Bang, um, which was once very short wavelength um, electromagnetic radiation, has now been redshifted to microwaves. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, radio waves can be used uh, to study lots of things. Um, one of the things that produces radio waves are, are, are cold nebulae of, of hydrogen gas. So um, radio waves have been used to, to map out the, the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy in a way that visible light could never have, could, you could never have used it for. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all the different um, wave bands that you can observe in. Um, I would say as well, telescope design, uh, there may ask you questions about the different sort of design of telescopes for the different, um, the different wave bands. Um, as with visible light, you need a, um, something to gather the, um, the light and, and focus it, or gather the radiation and focus it. You also need um, a detector. So with radio, um, generally that you have to use a very large parabolic reflector. They're usually called a dish. Um, so the reason why it has to be very large is because remember the Rayleigh criterion when we were discussing resolution, radio waves have a very long wavelength and the Rayleigh criterion says that the, the minimum resolution is wavelength divided by aperture. So if you have a very um, big aperture, that can compensate for the, uh, the, the idea that you have a, a very large wavelength that you're observing in. So radio dishes tend to be very large. Um, as as, as a, a, an advantage, you can make them out of wire mesh rather than, it doesn't have to be a perfectly shiny mirror. Um, unlike visible light, a wire mesh will, will reflect radio waves. Um, because of the long wavelength of radio waves, the, the, the surface of the, the reflector doesn't have to be as perfect as a, as a shiny mirror. Um, the detector for radio waves is usually some form of, of aerial, essentially, um, that situates at the focal point of the, uh, of the dish. So that's, that's radio waves. Um, infrared and ultraviolet, um, basically the, the design of telescopes for these instruments are the, pretty much the same as for a visible telescope. So you'll have a mirror and you'll have a, a detector. Um, there are some slight differences. So, so for instance, for infrared, this will also apply um, microwaves as well. You you have to keep your telescope and your detector really, really cool. Um, so CCD detectors do work for, for infrared, but they have to be kept very cool and the instrument has to be kept very cool. Otherwise, you'll end up looking at the heat signature from your instrument instead of looking at the heat signature from space that you're, you're, you're trying to measure. So um, they will use various cryogenic um, uh, materials usually to cool, cool down um, an infrared telescope, such as liquid, liquid helium or liquid nitrogen. So um, 
that's that's infrared. Ultraviolet, um, again, CCD cameras will work with ultraviolet. Um, reflecting mirrors will work with ultraviolet. Um, the only thing is with ultraviolet, apart from the fact you have to put them in space, is that the um, the quality of the mirror has to be very, very much greater than the quality of a mirror used in visible telescopes. Um, that's because the very short wavelength of ultraviolet um, means that any slight deviation of the mirror from being perfect, it will will cause great distortion of the of, of the image. So the mirror has to be perfectly parabolic. Um, on the other hand, the mirrors can be a bit smaller um, because you are using very short wavelength, um, so the, the mirrors don't have to be as as big as for an optical telescope to get the same resolution. Um, for X-rays. I mean, X-rays are interesting. Um, lenses don't work with X-rays, and uh, and normal mirrors don't don't really work with X-rays because um, unless you have a very large angle of incidence, almost ninety degrees, uh, a grazing angle of incidence, um, you don't get reflection. So the the optical design of X-ray telescopes is a little bit different, um, using sort of grazing um, grazing um, reflectors to, to to focus the light. And the, um, the, the detector for X-rays, um, well, old-fashioned detectors for X-rays were sort of based on, uh, on, on, on Geiger tubes, basically. They, they used ionisation to, to detect X-rays, but the, there are modern CCD cameras now that do work with X-rays as well. So that's basically it. So I've covered quite a bit of, um, of stuff there. I will give you some notes on show my homework and you will have um, some homework um, to do. So we're on when, uh, Tuesday today. I'm sorry I'm going through this fairly quickly, um, but I want to get it, try and get the, the astrophysics topic done um, in the next couple of weeks, um, so sort of before when you would have normally been going on study leave. Um, so if you can revise or, or you can go through those notes and obviously watch this, watch this video, and uh, do that homework, I think, for Friday evening. Um, so I'll put the deadline at Friday evening to get the homework in. Thank you very much.